Assalamu alaikum. Uh, assalamu alaikum, everybody. So, inshallah, we're going to uh, capstone this uh, two and a half days of hopefully intellectual stimulation and a lack of answers uh, with, uh, with our keynote speaker for this afternoon, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Madsen. So, uh, you all know her biography. I just want to point out a couple of things uh, that might be of relevance. Um, so, uh, Dr. Madsen presently is, the, uh, is a professor of Islam uh, at the Huron, Community, Hur Huron College of the University of Western Ontario. You all know that she served for many years as a vice president and then the president of the Islamic Society of North America. She, as you, you mentioned, she actually graduated with her a doctorate uh, from the University of Chicago, the Divinity School here, in 1999. One of her books is out uh, that she signed for us to, to purchase, The Story of the Quran, which actually is uh, available and should be in almost every public library in the United States because it was selected uh, as part of this initiative to introduce Islam uh, to the greater populace. So with that, I'm going to say that the title that you have in your books, uh, I don't believe she's going to speak about a Muslim party, uh, but rather uh, rejuvenating theological ethics for the, Islam, for the Muslim polity, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi I really enjoyed uh, this weekend here and uh, so grateful to all of you who um, have been teaching us all weekend. It's been a wonderful opportunity, if a little bit scattered in some ways. I think we've kind of, we have a lot of perspectives and sometimes it seems like it's not quite all fitting together, but it helps us understand at least, I think, some of the challenges that we're facing in trying to uh, create a field, develop a field. Um, first, I really wanna thank uh, Dr. Awesome who is uh, performing, you know, Fard Kafaya on behalf of all of us in, in uh, with this initiative, bringing us all together, leading this. Uh, it is so important, and he does it with unfailing politeness, patience, and good nature, despite the contentiousness of the uh, people who are sitting in this room uh, from time to time. And also, of course, uh, thanks to all of the sponsors uh, of this program. Uh, and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward each and every one of you who participated, leaving family and home, and also the first sunshine of the year, if you're from the Midwest and the East, uh, in many, many months to sit in this room. Uh, as in with so many of our lives as Muslims, um, so many areas of our lives as Muslims, we are a uh, work in progress as a community. And I know this is always the case, uh, uh, for that, I, I agree with Professor Ibrahim Musa uh, with what I think he was saying yesterday about um, that being a Muslim is fundamentally more about becoming than about being. Uh, but there are times when we are more in flux than at other times, and this certainly is one of those times. It's a time of flux, of change, of transition. And uncertainty makes human beings anxious. And I think this is a fundamental truth that we have to recognize really at the heart of Islamic bioethics, is the fact that there is anxiety about the uncertainty in so many areas affecting uh, this field. Uh, you know, when we think of the Muslim community today, I think for many of us, our first thought when we think about stressors, we think about terrorism, we think about Islamophobia. These certainly are major stressors of our community, but so too is uncertainty. And there are a lot of studies to support that. Um, you know, most of the studies about uh, uncertainty and choice uh, that are available to at least non-specialists or that really popularize or make the, this idea accessible are in the area of marketing because marketers are very interested in how people make choices when there are a plethora of possibilities. Um, so, you know, why when there are 12 different kinds of jam are you going to choose this one or that one? 
or not simply choose any jam at all because you walk out of that gigantic store with so many different varieties of things that you get a headache and dizzy and you you know you come out either you've you've spent like three times more money than you thought buying too many things or you come out because you're so confused you don't know what to get so this what what Barry Schwartz calls the paradox of choice is a reality uh, that is a human reality and um, so this is it, it's absolutely true that we need some way to manage the this pr proliferation of choice uh, Barry Schwartz in this book the paradox of choice a, a book I really like because I think he presents the arguments and the research very well talks about voluntarily embracing constraints on our freedom of choice that this is a rational thing to do it's rational to find heuristics uh, paradigms mechanisms that we voluntarily embrace for restraining, uh, uh, for constraining choice. Now, for Sunni Muslims um, lacking a, an infallible human interpreter, Medhabism functioned for a very long time as an effective way of managing choice. To, that's how I see it as someone who studied the history of Islamic law and legal theory and the development of the schools, their places in. Uh, uh, how how they developed historically. Now there are other people who would see these as, you know, the Medhebs as a, uh, you know, a, as a miracle by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, that um, that there was a necessity in these schools emerging. Um, and of course, those two things aren't uh, contradictory if we believe that all things are are in uh, Allah's destiny and command. But uh, what I want to say is that we could look at it as, as a rational mechanism, um, or at least that's how, how I do. That does not mean necessarily, though, that those paradigms uh, will always be the most rational. Um, Professor Ibrahim Musa was speaking yesterday about something called paradigm idolatry. And in the past, I have referred to a particular manifestation of that error as a traditionalism fetish, uh, meaning not not meaning that we don't continue or that some of us don't uh, don't continue by operating predominantly within a medheb system, but a fetishizing it to the point where it is uh, it really restrains our ability to see what's happening. Um, so we should not confuse our voluntary constraints with the sum total of truth. Uh, nor that any of the paradigms of the past will be completely sufficient to solve all of our uh, problems. I think today that we see the constant invocation of darura, the use of hayal and marginal rulings um, as evidence that there are uh, some serious problems. And beyond anything, what it does is that, that these techniques to... Um, to find a way to accommodate practices within the law actually uh, subverts the respect for the rule of law itself. Um, because the law becomes, and, and legal scholars become sort of with that, you know, with no disrespect to ER doctors, but it is a kind of emergency medicine approach to the law. We come in after someone has been run over by a truck and do our best uh, to patch them up at that point. So uh, we need to, to step back and look frankly and holistically at our community and say, is this a healthy community? Is this a healthy community, the Muslim community? And we could talk about that globally or in terms of America. Um, like Hajar, who is the, our spiritual matriarch, the, I consider her the founder of Mecca because it was only habitable because of her act of great faith and exertion and trust in Allah that uh, the water came, the, the sacred water that Allah opened there, the well of Zamzam, and we imitate her example today. But even with her faith, even with her tawakkul, her absolute tawakkul, right, her reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when the water began to flow, she ran to contain it. She was afraid that it would stop. You know, this blessing came, and so she, she tried to, 
kind of create a little basin around it, pushing the mud that was becoming clay as it was made wet to, to contain the water. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, God have mercy on her. If she had not done that, the water would have continued to have flow. So we all have this problem. We, we are afraid that the blessings that, that the blessings that we've had in the past, and that includes the blessings of knowledge, the blessings of guidance, the blessings, the epistemological blessings of how we can access um, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us, we're so afraid that they will stop and we keep trying to contain it. We tr keep trying to create that, that, that basin and sometimes it just means we're stopping the flow. So paradigm shifts, um, Quran talked about that. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Musa talked about that. I think the fact uh, last night at the dinner, uh, uh, Dr. Awesome mentioned um, Fazl Rahman and how many scholars there are today in America who studied with him or were part of or really influenced by his example. Um, so I think to, many, uh, to a large extent, the paradigm shift has already happened in American Islam and also the places where he had a tremendous effect, places like Indonesia, like Turkey. And since Professor Musa gave a, a little story yesterday about Fazl Rahman in a book, um, uh, don't have much time, but I have to say very quickly that I became a Muslim. I became a Muslim by reading a very, you know, poor translation of the last juz of the Quran. The Quran gave me faith in God. That 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 was it. You know, I opened the Quran. I was reading it because I knew it was a book of the Muslims. I had some Muslim friends, not religious, not pious, just good people, just, you know, my friends. And suddenly I found that belief in God, that not belief, awareness, knowledge of God that I had when I was a very small child, wandering barefoot through the woods in Canada, singing songs even before I could speak language. You know, singing praise in, in a pre-linguistic sense. I remember being that small and filled with the wonder of God. And that's what the Quran gave me back. But once I became a Muslim, the first book anyone gave me was Sayyid Qutb's Milestones. And I almost left Islam the next day. But thank God, alhamdulillah, I dropped in to a university bookstore. And I looked in the Islam section, and Fazl Rahman's book, Islam, was there. I opened it. And I said, this is it. And I wrote him a letter, and he wrote me back. A letter I still have before email. I'm so glad, because it's in his handwriting. I have the envelope inviting me to study with him. Now, he died before I was able to come back, because I had intended to and kept on with my intention of going working with Afghan refugees in and around Peshawar before I would come here for graduate school. But when I came here, his students were here. His books were here. And in some ways, I think about that. I think about how every time I looked for a sheikh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blocked me. Every time I looked for that one scholar, and I've had many scholars. I've studied with many scholars who have given me certification in different things. But I, it was always blocked, and I think there was some wisdom in that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I could keep my mind open to the situation of what was around me and where the ordinary person and where our community had needs. And where in a time of constant mobility, because I think we've, we've entered a new age, and this is part of the reality of our time today, we have entered a new age in the time of humanity. People. Allah created us with two legs. We've always been mobile. We've always, we've always moved. We've always gone through the land to seek education and sustenance. But, but we've never been as mobile as we are today, and that's not going to end. You know, Unless Allah ends it with some extraordinary means, it's not going to end. Everyone in this room has probably already lived in two, three, four uh, different places different cities. Many of us have lived in a number of different countries. So what does it mean to belong to a community? What does it mean to provide some consistency uh, and, and a feeling of stability and constancy in the community? And actually, 
this is something that physicians and those that deal with medicine and the body should think about very deeply. What will be consistent is our embodied selves. What we're taking with us is our body. And this religion has a lot to do with our body and to help us be settled in a place. So rather than ideologies, rather than commitment to this way of thinking or this scholar who lives 5,000 miles away, you used to live beside him, but now no longer. Now, you know, instead of superficial pledges of allegiance to this country or that, that you may only be living in three years, it's a question of really understanding where your body is because your person is embodied our, p our persons are embodied, where we are and how our bodies have ethical requirements and obligations where we are. And the first thing we do as Muslims, the first thing we do wherever we go, you get in the hotel room, visit someone, whatever technological means you have, either you look out the window if it's sunny or you look at your phone app and you figure out where the Qibla is. We have to know where we are in the land. We, uh, we, we need to know where we actually are. Then we need to figure out how to get water for wudu, you know? Land and water, land and water. And then we start to build our ethical requirements. The neighbor, take care of the neighbor. Who is our neighbor? How are we going to get to know them? So our food, how is it going to be lawful, right? Where, where are they? These, these are physical needs. So this issue of embodiment is really important. And I'd like to say that, that it is connected to the idea of the soul as well. And when I hear all these conversations about the soul, when does the soul leave the body? Is it connected? Are they one thing? One thing we should remember is that we will only have our final judgment when we are re-embodied souls. So this is the classical Sunni tradition, right? Is that we will be judged only when we are re-embodied. Okay. So it's so important. Um, by the way, this is also, a, from a pastoral perspective, a way to get people to feel more comfortable with letting go of their body. I mean, we feel sad when we have to give away our old car that we've driven around in for, you know, like we're so attached to it. Oh, I love that car. I spent so much time in that car. What about when we have to say goodbye to our body? But to be reminded, oh, you'll get it back. You'll get it back. We're just taking it away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it back to you in tip-top condition, right? Then it's like, okay, I will get it back. Because we are connected to, to, to that. So um, I want us really to think about the reality of our um, community. And, uh, you know, for me... Um, when I, when I think of, of paradigms and what Fazl Rahman gave me, he gave me so much and he also gave, he also influenced so many of my traditional scholars, people like Sheikh Muhammad Noor Abdullah who was here studying wi with him from Sudan and Mufti uh, Sheikh Mustafa Cheric, the, who was the Grand Mufti of Bosnia for so many years, who gives uh, you know, tremendous credit to Fazl Rahman influencing his ideas. So this, there isn't this like strict line between traditionalism and, and the kind of ethical approach to Islam that, that Fazl Rahman brought. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah, Omar Farooq Abdullah, Sheikh Omar Farooq Abdullah talks about the influence of Fazl Rahman. So I think we also have to be very careful about making these really hard, firm categories and say, okay, this is, you know, this is authentic or traditional knowledge and this is a, a completely different category because there is so much overlap and uh, really creative and productive um, uh, knowledge uh, development and, and paradigm sharing. I would like to say that when it comes to ethic, my ethics, we're talking about theological ethics to be used in, in, in Islam and medicine and bioethics, you know, and, and where, do, where do the norms come from? I mean, for me, it comes primarily, and I think anyone in a service profession, and we should all think of ourselves as, as people of service, that for me it comes primarily one from a feeling of, of absolute gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me uh, life and guidance. Uh, I'm just full of, of gratitude and, and it makes me so happy to be able to, to say that and live that and express that. Second, 
gratitude to the Muslim community who no matter, you know, no matter how poor that translation of that little juz of the Quran was, I only, the Quran only got to my hand because people preserved the Quran since the time of the Prophet Muhammad SSM. They put tremendous effort into preserving the Quran, into transmitting it faithfully, into making accessible translations. So, you know, we cannot be ungrateful to, to all of those who, who came before. And I, I sometimes, I was at a conference a few weeks ago where there was some of the Quranists, some of the people who are like, well, we'll just, you know, rely on the Quran alone and we're not gonna go with any hadith or all this, you know, all this stuff, all this, this tradition. I'm like, how did you get this Quran? You know, you didn't receive wahi. How, wh what's, the, what's the mechanism um, that it came in, into your hands? And you have confidence in its authenticity. You know, so we really need to have that. But I would also say that I'm motivated by, uh, I don't look uh, like it probably, I don't know, maybe my irritation about loud lunches or something might suggest to you that there's a little bit of anger underlying the surface. Anger because I feel uh, and I see and I've witnessed, I've been a witness to so many Muslims being blocked from the mercy of Allah from having a positive, healthy relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, by really problematic arguments, by unnecessary blocks to their health and their ability to realize all of their capacities, physical, spiritual, emotional, in so many different ways. You know, when I, when I were, went to work with Afghan refugee women, I, I was looking, how, what, what can you possibly do in a refugee camp that's gonna help people? You know, people who are, are going to be, you, they may be moving the next day. I mean, it, the, the kinds of infrastructure projects that many people were, were building, many organizations were, that were rusting and not working, were just ridiculous. It really gave me, spending some time just hanging out with those people and I did that for a few months before I even let, you know, before I even started to coalesce any idea of what I could possibly bring to help their situation was just being with them, just living with them, hanging out, seeing what would happen. I saw that those people, they knew pretty much what they needed. And they were doing the best that they could to provide it for each other. But they lacked some knowledge, they lacked some skills, they lacked some resources. and. Consequently, I developed a, a midwife training program for women in that camp and for women who had already stepped up and were providing leadership and trying to help in the situation. Um, the numbers of deaths of children, unnecessary deaths, because they s didn't simply know how to make, uh, how to identify um, uh, dehydration when it would be, you know, potentially fatal and how to make a simple rehydration formula what vaccinations could, what benefit they could provide, what were signs of a dangerous pregnancy so that they knew that, that they had to get that woman to the hospital and not have a normal delivery, et cetera. And the, you know, the camp, I mean, many people had been killed, of course. The war was their biggest problem obviously the war was the biggest problem the fact that they were refugee refugees were the biggest problem but frankly there were religious scholars in that camp who also were not helping um, exaggerated sense uh, an exaggerated emphasis on on making sure that uh, there was zero percent chance of any kind of sexual impropriety meant telling women that they had to stay in their homes and not access sources of knowledge and skills uh, meant that children and women were dying in horrible ways. Um, a completely unbalanced approach to the necessities of life. Uh, and that made me really angry. And I see that, that um, you know, what was it that made them think, like assess the risk and benefits th to this way, right? If we talk about, about all of the different necessities of life, the necessities of the Sharia, 
life, religion, property, family, I will get back to that, et cetera. I mean, who's making that assessment? Who's making the risk-benefit assessment? And on the basis of what knowledge, on the basis of what factual statements about people's capacities, uh, desires, needs, and abilities, um, it showed to me that if you have juridic and, and legal decisions being made by a body that, is not, that does not reflect the demographics of the community, that you could have very well-intentioned good people make deadly mistakes because they simply do not have an accurate understanding of how other human beings operate. So where does, you know, if we jump to this, and I, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do because fortunately I don't have a lot of time, but well, let me, I'll get to that in a minute, um, more detail. But what I want to do is simply outline, outline very quickly some theological, ethical concerns that I think we need to take into consideration as we undertake the development of this field. And this comes out of my experience with the community. It comes out of my pastoral perspective, frankly. But it also comes out of an ethical perspective, really believing that ethics is about, um, uh, about understanding um, you know, how to bring all of the various concerns into the right balance and the right prioritization. So number one, when we talk about the principles of classic, you know, Western bioethics, we all know autonomy, um, non-malfeasance, uh, beneficence and justice. One of the things that I think is really important, and we saw this in, in uh, Marinisa, I think it was in your thing about the husband's consent. Um, I've heard Muslim scholars talk about, well, autonomy. Is that really an Islamic principle? Aren't we more about the, about the family? Or aren't we more about the community welfare? Well, I would say using, invoking, say, Fazl Rahman's principle of, of taking seriously the seventh century context of the revelation, we have to acknowledge that collectivism was the pre-Islamic cultural and political norm. Right? I mean, this was the dominant norm that, that your individual wishes or welfare or desire to interest really didn't matter. That whoever, that the decision making body of the tribe um, had the right to use you, instrumentalize persons for the sake of the wealth, the good of the group. A perfect example is marriage. Neither a boy nor a girl um, had the right to demand that their consent was, um, uh, was obtained before they were put into a marriage in the pre-Islamic system, right? So they could be the tribal sheikh or elder or, or the male guardian could force a, a, a young man or a young woman into a marriage without their consent for the sake of the of the group. So the instrumentalization of an individual for the sake of the group, the individual putting their interests, you know, on the back burner for the sake of the group, was the norm of 7th century Arabia. We see that, that the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, intervened consistently, we don't have time to go over all of those, in the direction of non-instrumentalization of individuals for the sake of others that you are a subject in yourself and that you have rights and then you have autonomy. And so I think we need to take that seriously. It doesn't mean that people aren't embedded in, in social groups. It doesn't mean that they don't care about their family. It doesn't mean that there isn't reciprocity within the family where, where I, put, I serve you and you serve me, where I put my interests um, you know, behind to help my parents and my parents put their interests behind to help me, husband and wife, etc. But it's a reciprocal, right, and voluntary process. People have to be consulted in anything that involves them, and the consent must be meaningful. Even Sayyidina Ibrahim uh, 
when he uh, received a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he consulted his son and he said, what do you think? Mada tara? What do you think? Right? It wasn't, this is a, a prophet who's been given by a command by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only the patriarch, right, but also prophet who says to the son, what do you think? Does not do anything without uh, consent. Of course, Hajar, may Allah be pleased with her, also demanded to know whether, when, when Sayyidina Ibrahim brought her to the desert, whether this was from his own judgment or was a command of Allah. And then she made the decision to stay there and make a life and depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, when we talk about things like tawakkul, it is not the right of any one person to impose their heroic spirituality on others, right? So when we're looking at the family and saying, okay, my relative is here suffering, should they take medicine? They're sick, should they get treatment? They, you know, it's, it's, they're under a, gr a great deal of pain, should they take the pain medicine? It is the right of the person to decide what tawakkul means for them and, and how far they can go and what they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with in their sense. So that we think of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad them, when they were given the khiyar, the choice. They were given the choice of whether to stay in this high stakes marriage, right? A high stakes marriage that meant that if they do, did good, they'd get tri twice the reward. And if they did bad, they'd get twice the punishment. But they were given the choice. So people have a choice for that, and that's very important in when we talk about, uh, about these um, settings. Uh, second, um, when we talk about the instrumentalization of the bodies of others, if we think of something like <clears throat> all of the new reproductive techniques and uh, organ transplantation, all of these different things, again, uh, it is very clear that we are not allowed to use others simply for, for, for our purposes in a way where they are objects to be taken from. So if, you, if, we, if we look at the example of the milk mother, for example, in the Islamic tradition, this is where a woman will nurse another woman's child or another person's child. Either the mother has died or the mother is incapable or the family simply decides they don't want to nurse their own child, right? So this is this is this woman who is, um, you know, being you could say being used to feed the child. But Subhanallah, in Islamic law, this woman is not just used; it is a reciprocal relationship. The milk mother not only gets paid, but she has rights. She has the right to respect and love for the rest of her life from that child. We think of the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, the great love that he showed. There are so also are actual rights in terms of and legal, legal relationships that are established through that milk mother relationship. It's not that she's simply, you know, a source of milk like any, like a cow and to be put to the side. This is a human being and these are human relationships. Um, uh, next, what is medicine? And this is an area, please, we need, this is just a call out for research. What does medicine tell us about sexuality and gender? And what do Muslim scholars and jurists need to know about this? Many Muslim religious leaders are drawing on paradigms and taxonomies of sexuality and gender that they consider to be Islamic or traditional, but are simply the Indic or Hellenic paradigms available to Muslim scholars uh, of the past. Worse probably are the Victorian paradigms of sexuality and gender introduced to some of the Muslim world under colonialism. So the idea that women are irrational due to their essential emotional nature, that men have compelling sexual needs that must be satisfied, that women are the natural passive partners in a sexual relationship. So there is still a just a widespread misuse of outdated paradigms and disproven theories of gender and sexuality to justify misogyny, um, irresponsible so-called marriages, misyar marriages, and others um, that, that 
you know, really are, are about a kind of jurisprudential gymnastics or that, 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 cr that leads to a jurisprudential gymnastics to satisfy, you know, the purported uh, um, overwhelming sexual needs of men and at the same time to completely deny that women have uh, needs that also uh, must be accommodated. Um, I think we have to look very realistically at the sexuality of young people. The fact that there is a huge gap in the um, sexual maturity, the peak of sexual, uh, you know, sort of desire and uh, late marriage and the, the solutions that have been come up with uh, juridically are, are sometimes not that helpful. Sometimes they also involve, unfortunately I've seen many fatwas where uh, the solution that traditional scholars are given, uh, have given is, is to say, I mean I think in this way the Shiite tradition is much more upfront. They say, you know, you can have a temporary marriage, it's, it's consensual, both, both partners understand what they're getting into. But uh, across the board, there are traditional and very well-respected Sunni scholars who are saying things like, well, you can't really have a temporary marriage because that's haram, muta'a marriage is haram. But if you think, you know, if your intention really is to divorce but not on a specific date, uh, you can go ahead and marry, but don't do it with Arab women. I mean, literally, that's a fatwa. I don't want to cite the person who, who said that. Um, but in, in what way is it possible that that woman is giving consent, right? Is giving consent to that marriage if she thinks it's a permanent marriage and he knows that it's not really? And, and why is this being justified? It's being justified according to a biological conception of the, the, the needs of men. Um, and so we really need a lot of work in this area. The issue of harm reduction, the fact that ISPU has done very excellent social policy research, the Institute for Social Policy Understanding, that really needs to be brought in the mix of uh, Islam and medicine and bioethics. When you look at the huge, the almost, you know, almost half of our young people are engaging in sexual relations before marriage. Um, what does that say about, you know, where does harm reduction come in? Where does sexual education come in? In this very city, you have this wonderful organization, Heart Women and Girls, that is uh, uh, producing a lot of research in this area and trying to bring awareness. Um, is that being picked up in the Islamic schools? Is it being picked up in the Masajid? In youth, how do we do that responsibly in you know, draw on that research responsibly in to, to promote our values, to promote our religious practices and beliefs, uh, yet I in a way that um, is really responsible. Um, I would like to look at, I think we need to look back at the so-called uh, necessities of the Sharia, especially the fifth necessity. Now, we've seen that people say, well, sometimes it's translated as preserving paternity. Sometimes it's translated as preserving lineage. And then some people just kind of jump over and say, oh, and sometimes it means family, right? Those are very different things. So, so the necessity of having a family is very different than the necessity of having paternity. And I think, again, we need to be able to not just sort of take what has been said, but say, well, why was paternity, why is paternity so important? To the extent that the mu'amalat are based on rationales, what can we actually discover are the rationales for these things? In an era with no birth control, um, with uh, where children were adopted without their consent, right? And given a, their, their um, lineage, uh, their biological lineage was erased and they were given a new identity. Um, in a time when there are so many children on this earth who do not have the basic necessities of life, much less a loving, caring home. Um, is it, you know, should the emphasis really be, I'm not saying that paternity is not important, but should we really be, be thinking about children? about children and families. And the necessity is to have 
children in loving families and to have families, because that certainly is a very strong theme of the Quran and of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam. And we see in his own personal life how important that was, the creation of family, bringing people into a family, in, uh, into a caring uh, situation. Um, uh, I would like us to take seriously uh, embodied trauma. Um, it is, we, we all are aware that a huge part of our community has experienced war. Um, our refugees have experienced or witnessed violence. Um, uh, in a, in a war situation, technically a war situation, but also in our cities. When you look at a city like Chicago, how many people who live here how many Muslims and a quarter to a third of our community, the Muslim American Muslim community is African American who are disproportionately affected by this violence, who also are terrorized by the possibility of having violence inflicted on them by, by the state and by the police. Uh, are we taking seriously the, the, what does it mean to be healthy? What are the medical implications of this? Um, and, and what is necessary uh, for healing? How does, that also, how does that trauma also affect our community leaders? The ones who are, who are teaching and leading the community and establishing priorities. It is their own, their own traumatic experiences skewing their perspective of risk and benefit and what is necessary uh, in the community. Um, the medical implications of racism, again, I mean, I, 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 we cannot look at this as, oh, that's the, the issue for the black community. The black community is our community. I, I mean, if we're talking about um, American Muslim community, this is, this is a huge section of our community. I mean, why are we not taking more seriously the medical implications of racism, um, the, the transgenerational trauma, the racist views of black bodies, which is a biological reality, right? The, we're talking about statements being made and views being formed of people's bodies, their value, uh, the, uh, to what extent they're threatening or benign or worthy. Um, so whose life uh, really matters? Um, and as I finish, I want to say that uh, chaplains have been mentioned in this conference here and there. I want to say that they are, there is a, um, the uh, chaplain's um, conference going on at Hartford Seminary this weekend, so it may be why there are not more uh, here, but Shamsia is here, who's a hospital chaplain representing Zainab. Any other hospital chaplains? Um, uh, yes, Quran. Chaplains are the solution to many of these problems. I'm just gonna make a, like an like a outright <laughs> statement. I mean, because the thing, the, the thing is that chaplains are required to have training in the Islamic legal and ethical and theological spiritual tradition and also to be supervised in work in a hospital setting and they study bioethics and they study the um, you know not they're not professional bioethicists but they benefit from that they study that and they are the ones who are able to be that bridge I mean doctors are not you know, I just spent eight months in the hospital with my daughter. And I'll tell you, the most, the, the, the people who provided the most healing to her were the people who cleaned the floor because they took the time to, to they looked at her as a human being first, right? Um, then the people who served the food, uh, then the nurses. I, I'm not, just the doctors did a wonderful job too. But what I'm saying is that when we think about, about what heals, right? I want us to think about, and this is what I've always said to chaplains. What chaplains are, they're bringing the healing presence that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam exemplified. It, there, there's nothing that can replace a person. So please, if any of you are responsible in hospitals about some of these decisions about like robots being, bringing the food tray or stuff like that, no, we need human beings. But chaplains bring full presence, right? So, so the Prophet Muhammad says someone, he talked to someone, he looked at them full face. He held their hand. Right? What, 
we have evidence, and we could bring this in, the healing, the evidence that those actions are healing for people. Touch is healing. Presence is healing. Care is healing. And that's the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we need to, to really understand that um, that this is not just you know something they're sitting there you know chatting doing on the side. It is really an important part uh, of the care team. And uh, with that, I'll end. I know some of you have to run to the airport, so don't. I, I I'm not going to be offended if you need to leave. And the rest who can stay, we'll have a few minutes to chat. Inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> So inshallah, we have uh, the floor open for some questions for Dr. Madsen. And I will pass you the mic. So are there any? Um, there's a number of organizations have been uh, closed down uh, closed down by the government. And I, my question to you is, is there another strategy, is there another strategy for, um, for the special program for the women's shelter? Um, there is a number of uh, women's shelter have been closed down or you do you have uh, an idea or an alternative um, method for women to also be set up or preserved? Charity is no substitute for justice, okay? So there are some things that are simply matters of justice, and, and, and we have to look at, I mean, I think the problem with some of these shelters is that they're relying on charity, right, or a concept of charity, of people giving in charity. Charity is simply to fill in the gap, right? It's, it's to fill in gaps that inevitably occur. But it's different than justice. So justice is, is structuring society in a way that the, the expected and normal needs of people will be fulfilled. Their basic, uh, their, their urgent needs will be fulfilled, right? We know that in every society, that at every time, there will be some, you know, a certain percent of people who will need to access these institutions. In my mind, that's a state obligation. And, and as Muslims, if, we, like if we're serious about it, we shouldn't look at it only as a, a, as a charitable activity, but as something that um, would influence the way we vote for people, the way we, um, you know, consider how we, th we would like our tax dollars to be used. Um, so that's that's my view is that there's is that we we tend to you know the the most important needs sometimes we we just put them in the charity box oh and people should support it and give it to it but but charity is no substitution for justice so we've got to step back and look how is this being structured because any any like if there's a Muslim woman in this society she's American she should be treated not just as a Muslim she'd be be treated as an American who has the same rights as everyone else, and every American should have the right to safety and security at the most basic level. Right. Other questions? Kind of, can you explain more what kind of change you see in Turkey in terms of philosophy about uh, how to approach the Islam, traditional Islam or modern Islam? And the second question is, when you consider Jamal al-Din Afghani and Hassan al-Banna, how do you see last hundred years Islamic reform and uh, what we will see next 30 years? Right. So, I, I mean, I understand this context very well, but I know I had many colleagues, many, many friends who were studying here with me, and I've gone and visited them, and they've influenced his paradigms to really, to, to, to help shape their view of what Muslims need to do, how we can create a hermeneutic, a Quranic hermeneutic, um, that is that is authentic, that is really grounded in the Sunnah, and is also um, you know able to, to, to continue to engage with the current um, situation. Now, the, you know, um, there have been, of course, you know, modernity. Uh, there's a lot of problems with modernity. The question is, where did the problems come from? You know, are the problems exegetical? Are the problems because of a certain kind of hermeneutics? Or are the problems political? There are some things that, that need to be solved politically. Um, and, and, you know, one of the choices 
one, one of the options for managing a plethora of choice is political. So, and that is also traditional Islamic. So siyasa, siyasa sharia, is administrative law. And it really are, it, it's about making, making policy, deciding among the many choices which is going to be the policy of this polity, right? Of this state or this region or whatever. And that is a legitimate way to manage um, the, the how to choose among many different options. Now, you could have, you could have a, you know, you know, it's also a political question, who will make that decision? Who will make that choice? I believe, you know, I really believe that, that it should be the, the consent of the people, that there should be a political mechanism that, that really reflects the, the will and the diversity of the whole community. You know, I don't want one person deciding that, or one council that reflects all the precisely same demographic. And again, it's not because men are evil or anything like that. It's because you are, I mean, would we ever say, okay, only white people are going to decide for, for the rest of society? You know, are, are, are you saying that because I'm, because I'm white, I'm necessarily racist? No. But I'm, I have a race. I do have a positionality. We all do. So that's why our, our decision-making process should reflect the diversity of the community. And, you know, it's so easy to slip back into paternalism because human beings are arrogant. We're arrogant. Um, and we, we, the, this is a temptation. And it's also, you know, charismatic leadership is, is powerful. It's attractive. And so there's that also that you know, that temptation, and many people just are like, oh, I don't want to, you know, it's too much. That's why you do need experts, but you don't need, you know, authoritarian, domineering, you know, uh, slice of society to decide everything. And one of the things that I'm struck with is that um, the medical system has not been able to develop a normative conception of gender development, but that there is growing evidence that in that transgendered individuals have much better psychological outcomes if they transition. And so um, the evidence there is then kind of more empirical than uh, conceptual. So do you think that there are mechanisms within the Islamic tradition to incorporate that as an empirical claim as opposed to calling for a underlying change in a theory of gender? Mm. Is there such a thing as transgender people in Islamic society historically? And absolutely the evidence is there, historical evidence and anthropological evidence currently. Um, it's almost all, almost all the evidence is in the direction of, of trans women, not trans men, which is interesting. Um, is, is the male public sphere so um, carefully guarded <laughs> that it just becomes impossible, or are, are women sort of more accept? You know, what is it? What is it? I'm not sure, but I would say that you know there is this issue about the internal reality and the external reality that people talked about today, right? Like someone's subjective state. What about knowing wh how who you are? What can you? You know, I, I have rheumatoid arthritis, and when I ask my doctor, you know, should I fast or should I not fast, you know, oh, his answer, pious Muslim doctor was, well, you have to assess what, you know, how you feel, your level of pain, w discomfort, whether that is impacting your, you know, your ability to be, you know, to feel close to God, to feel close to God. You know, that's part of it. Ultimately, the highest objective is, is religion. And so that, that, confidence of who you are inside um, does it does it matter I think it does matter and for me because I'm not a doctor I'm not a researcher in this area when I've had uh, recently for example uh, someone who just underwent um, uh, surgery uh, gender reassignment surgery is a trans woman and also a new convert to Islam which is a lot of change in someone's life you know uh, for me I, I, I just really, I prayed and I thought about it because all she was asking is, are there any, you know, is there something you could say to me from the Islamic tradition can give me some guidance? And of course there's, you know, the muhannath, uh, which is the, 
uh, sort of effeminate men in Islamic tradition. There's all that stuff, but I was really looking from a pastoral perspective, a kind of chaplain perspective, more from a spiritual perspective. And I really, uh, you know, what came to my mind after a prayer and reflection was the fact that a dominant theme of the Quran is, is that there can be a big disjunction between the inner and outer reality. And I asked her to read Surat Yusuf, which is the most, maybe where that lesson is most intense, about that there are, there are places where the, the, you know, where all the external signs are untrue. Um, the, the, the evidence, the external evidence is actually false evidence. Um, and there's confidence of, of the truth of the inner reality. And so for me, that's a kind of spiritual reading that I could bring to her to say, well, this is, we may not understand this, like completely, I can't give you some scientific answer, but I, I know certainly that there can be a disjunction and a disconnect between the uh, external reality and the internal reality. So let's think about, let's think about that. Let's at least rely on that, and then we can think about the other things, the fiqh issues and the medical issues and, and others. But have confidence that God knows. God always knows the inner reality. To me, that's what's important. With remarks, on remarks with the transgender thing, how far do you go is a question, like, you know, in car accommodating the other um, communities like you know if you're talking about transgender are you going to accommodate the others also would be the what do you, sorry what do you mean by other communities LGBT I mean like you know the whole range of it right. well so, so I mean you know uh, right it is mm -hmm. that's a bigger question and it is a very um, a very frequently we are asked right but I think that's the first step is to acknowledge that that there is, I mean, and this is nothing new, it's not an invention. We have lots of historical evidence of it, that there have always been a small slice of the population that has a uh, predominant or exclusive uh, same-sex uh, attraction. Now, what is the solution to that? I mean, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the that's a different issue than, what can you do as a sexual person then? You know, that, that's a completely different question. That's a fit question, and it's a, but it's a question that is in the area also, not of Ibadat, of Muhammad, <laughs> of, of bringing together evidence, um, clinical evidence, scientific evidence, as well as fit evidence. But we have, we have gay people in our community and again, like for me, I, I can't give you, I, I can't tell you what, you know, as a doctor, but I know as a pastoral person that, that I talk, you know, the way I counsel people who are struggling with the fact that they have needs or desires that um, from what we can see cannot be accommodated with, it, with Islamic Sharia, what, what, is that, what does that gap mean spiritually? What opportunity does it provide for getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do you see something? And this is, it's, it's not only with them. There are many people who have illnesses where they can't, they can't, um, that impact their ability to have sexual intimacy. Um, yes, you could say, okay, there, there's diseases that can be cured, but not everything can be. Um, when, how do you understand this not only as a loss, but also as an opportunity for service, um, as an opportunity to devote love and attention, um, you know, in another sphere? Is there any benefit of sublimation uh, for society if you choose that, if you choose sublimation? Can it actually benefit uh, other people in terms of having tremendous energy and love and a desire for closeness that maybe you can... I mean, I, I knew a, a, a homosexual Muslim who decided to devote his life to children who were uh, uh, homeless children and homeless people who no one else was giving attention to because of this de desire for closeness. So I think there's a lot of um, things, but I know you want to talk uh, about it in a different area, but we don't have time for that now. So sorry about that. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and guide all of us and uh, bring us together in love and care uh, for each other and for all of those 
who come in our uh, contact with us and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to serve all of his creation, um, who, all of whom have uh, the same dignity uh, because they are created by the one who we all uh, adore and worship. <laughs>